Hi, welcome to my channel, Cardiology and Beyond. I'm Dr. Sonali, an interventional cardiologist from India. In today's video, we'll be talking about the arterial pulse, focusing mainly on how a pulse is generated and propagated. Now, the arterial pulse is one of the most vital and one of the most informative signs of the cardiac clinical examination and this particular topic will be covered over several videos in order to grasp it fully. First off, what is the purpose of the arterial system? Number one, it is to deliver oxygenated blood to the rest of the tissues and secondly, to convert the intermittent cardiac output or the pulsatile nature of the heart into a continuous capillary flow in order to distribute this oxygenated blood to the rest of the tissues. Now when it comes to the division of arteries, there are three gross levels. Number one are the elastic arteries or the central vessels which consist of the aorta up to the iliac bifurcation and it also consists of the main branches of the aorta which include the carotids and the innominate artery. Now together these elastic arteries are known as the reservoir arteries because they have a lot of elastic tissue in them. The concept is, is that more an elastic an artery is, greater is the volume accommodated by that artery for a small rise in pressure, which is to say that these arteries are highly compliant. The second level of arteries are the intermediate arteries, also known as the transitional arteries, which consist of the iliacs, the subclavians and the axillary arteries. And the third level are the muscular arteries, which have more of a muscular tissue in their wall as against elastic tissue. And the examples are the radial artery and the femorals. What is felt when you palpate the arterial pulse? Now, a change in the wall tension of the artery is what leads you to palpate the pulse. And what governs this wall tension change is the change in the amplitude of the pressure wave, that is the force with which the vessel hits your palpating finger and also a change in the radius of that artery. Now, all these changes are governed by a law called the Laplace's law in which the tension of the wall in the artery is equal to pressure into radius divided by wall thickness. So, when there's a change in the pressure and also the radius of the artery between systole and diastole, that's when a change in tension is appreciated and hence you're able to palpate that artery. What affects the radius of the arterial system in the Laplace's law equation? Now, volume has a direct effect on radius or diameter. In the case of proximal elastic vessels, which are the central vessels which we saw earlier, they receive almost all of the stroke volume and hence there's a greater displacement and a greater change in the radius on account of these elastic fibers. When it comes to the peripheral muscular vessels, the number of muscular fibers is more than the elastic fibers and as a result these vessels are less distensible. Additionally, as you go down the arterial tree, there's an increase in the cross-sectional area and each vessel receives only a fraction of the stroke volume. So what this means is, for a similar rise in pressure, the change in diameter or the change in radius is less. In other words, in order to achieve a similar diameter change in the peripheral vessels, the pressure developed in these vessels is much higher than the pressure developed in the central elastic vessels. What is the difference between the pressure pulse wave and the blood flow in the arteries? Now the pressure pulse wave is generated by the contraction in the left ventricle which is transmitted to the peripheral arteries at once. So the one which is depicted in blue arrows is the pressure pulse wave and that goes very quickly to the rest of the arterial tree and as you can see it goes so fast that it even gets reflected from the peripheral arterioles. Now the actual blood flow in the arteries which is the blood that leaves the left ventricle takes several cardiac cycles to reach this same distance. So this blood flow lags behind the pressure pulse wave which goes much faster. Now what are the components of the arterial pulse wave contour? Now there are three possible waves which can be seen in an arterial line tracing. First is the percussion wave, second is the tidal wave and third is the dichrotic wave. 
the percussion wave is the initial systolic portion of the pressure pulse and this is always seen in every arterial tracing. The tidal wave is seen in the later part of the systolic portion. It is not necessary that it will always be seen, but in some circumstances it is very prominent. The dichrotic wave on the other hand is a diastolic wave which follows the dichrotic notch and this is the dichrotic notch which corresponds to the closure of the semilunar valves that is it corresponds to the second heart sound. Now when you take an arterial pressure wave at any site it is a combination of the incident pressure wave which travels very quickly from the left ventricle to the rest of the arterial tree and the reflected waves which come back from the periphery where the reflection usually occurs at the level of the arterioles. The question is, what factors are responsible for the production of an arterial pulse wave? Now, as I've alluded to before, there are two components of an arterial pressure wave. First is the incident pressure wave and second is the reflected wave. Now, the incident pressure wave is the same thing as the initial systolic wave or the percussion wave that we just saw. Whereas the reflected wave is a combination of all the reflected arterial pulse waves which come back from the level of the arterioles. Now they can give rise to either the tidal wave if, if the reflection occurs during systole or it, these waves can give rise to the dichrotic wave if these waves return during the phase of diastole. So what factors affect the incident pressure wave? Number one is aortic compliance or stiffness of the aorta. Second is the momentum to the ejecting blood, which is equal to mass into velocity of ejection and mass of the blood is nothing but the stroke volume of the blood. The velocity of ejection of blood is in turn dependent on various factors such as contractility of the left ventricle, which is dependent on dp by dt that is change of pressure per change of time that is how quickly it is able to eject the blood out of its chamber other factors like preload afterload and intrinsic contractility of the left ventricle determine the velocity of ejection and also impedance to ejection or the afterload overall also has a role in determining the velocity of ejection Additionally, the pulse wave velocity is also determined by the mean arterial pressure as well as the overall arterial stiffness of the entire arterial tree. Now, what factors affect the reflected waveforms that return from the periphery back to the heart? Number one is the peripheral resistance. Second is the distance of the site of reflection from the heart. The time of arrival in the cardiac cycle, as I mentioned, if it arrives in systole, it gives rise to a tidal wave. If it arises in diastole, it gives rise to a dichrotic wave and also the duration of left ventricular ejection. So how does a stiffened aorta affect the aortic pressure? The pressure rises steeply because of the inherent stiffness of the aorta because the aorta is now no longer compliant or elastic and it is no longer able to relax in order to accommodate all the stroke volume during that systolic phase. So that leads to an increased peak systolic pressure and an increased pulse pressure. So watch part two of the arterial pulse in the next video in which we'll go into the details of all the factors that affect the incident wave as well as the reflected wave. Like always, like, share, subscribe, comment and press the bell icon and I'll see you next time with the next video.